Uh, the first one is from Min Chao Nguyen. He asks, is there a standalone viable sanitation model? You know, when we think about our sanitation marketing model, I, I saw somebody had the five A's of, or sorry, the four A's of social marketing before. Um, those really kind of rang true with me. I'm trying the affordable, available, acceptable, aware. Um, you know, we think when we think about our sanitation marketing model, we think about something similar, which is are the products desirable? Um, you know, are people going to be willing to buy them? Are they viable? So that viability, I think, I'm not sure if that gets to the standalone part of, um, of the question asker's question, but you know, can businesses and individuals make money by, by selling these products and services? And then are they, you know, are they technically feasible? Um, so those are the, the three that we think about desirable, viable, and feasible. Um, happy to happy to answer that question maybe a little more clearly if I can just get a little more okay. detail. Um, can you hear like? me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Yeah, my question because I've done a lot of work on this and it sanitation business is very difficult to be viable. So normally the producer has what they call bundling services. They sell product materials alongside with you know for construction or they do installations or they do some other thing that has nothing to do with sanitation in order to be able to survive. And normally selling latrines uh, for this viable business is a very small portion of their business. So my question related to that, um, the, the business margin that you show there, is it just for selling latrines or is it the margin for the whole business, which also including some other uh, material services? Is that, is that great question? Thanks for thank you for clearing that up, Ming Chao. Um, yeah, so the the data that I showed you is is just for the sale of latrines, so that doesn't include. I think you're right that, and as I mentioned, I think a lot of the latrine producers that we work with, <laughs> excuse me, have established businesses. They have other uh, you know lines of business that they're involved in. But what I showed you is is just the sanitation portion of what they're doing. Um, and I, I I don't know. I mean. I think potentially the jury is still out on whether there's, you know, a, a standalone in, in the rural context, especially if there's a standalone viable business model for sanitation. I think some of the work that our Cambodia program is doing um, to so so just for instance, they've rolled out a shelter product. So, um, you know, in, in addition to the substructure of the latrine, also selling a, a solid shelter product. Uh, that has yeah, pretty significant you, margins you, associated you with it, and having history. that as an option uh, for latrine producers. Sorry, I don't mean to monopolize, but just quickly, if you read the go history ahead, go ahead, report, Rachel. yeah, um, if you read the history report that talk about you know rural marketing, rural sanitation program, it clearly says that you know just selling the underground and just doing like it is not a viable business. So they need a very high margin type of business to go along with selling latrines. So I'm just throwing out there. I think if you look into Histra website, you see that report, and I think you are part of that study too, IDE. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think you're right, and that's that's where this sort of experimentation with um, with higher margin products like these shelters comes into play. I mean, I I think um, the Cambodia team would be the first to say, you know, we're still. We're kind of in the in the testing phase. We're in very few communities with those shelter products, um, but I think they're I think they're working towards the same kind of issues that you're talking about. Uh, Simon, can you hear as well? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm just going to um, ask one of the questions uh, that was directed to you, Simon, from uh, Molly Goodwin Kunchitsky. How are you targeting tenants differently from non-tenant house? Non-tenant households, uh, we, 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 within the towns that we've focused on, we've had the two different situations. We've had, uh, uh, for example, Nakuru town that has lots of absentee landlords, meaning that, uh, uh, you know, the tenant, tenants stay there by themselves or uh, under the, you know, the care of uh, some caretaker. And, and in that situation, then, uh, the approach is to actually inspire the households, the tenants, to demand for sanitation uh, facilities, improved sanitation facilities from their landlords. And this they could do uh, 
through the, the you, you know the agents or or the the, the caretakers of this uh, you know these plots. So uh, the, the, the 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 animator, the social marketer, would go to the households, and that's as I did say earlier, it's one on one communication with each and every household. And then you know uh, ask questions as to what are the what what kind of facilities they are accessing at the moment, the challenges they are facing, and how they can approach the landlord. And then uh, with that, uh, the caretakers then are able to communicate with the landlords. But here you would find that what comes to be a very important component is the inclusion of the public health department. So, so the animators would come with a carrot that is saying the beauty of having improved sanitation, saying the incentives available for, you know, constructing a toilet, telling you about availability of uh, artisans to do the work for you. But then the public health officer would then also demand, and that's where now the, the stick comes in, that, you know, uh, <coughs> everybody has a, a right to access improved sanitation and this then throws the households into demanding this from the, the landlords. Now the same particularly apply for uh, you know non uh, what you call uh, non-tenant uh, uh, households, the, 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 the households that are purely owned by the occupants and, and, and so um, we would go the same way and here what they see there is value proposition when you tell them to have improved sanitation which they can access with their families. There is also the element of permanency. So they will see this as a long-term, uh, you know, uh, intervention for their families. So they really, uh, the, 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 the question of bringing on board even the public health uh, officials to actually kind of, uh, you know, threaten these households is not there because they see, they outrightly see the value of uh, investing in sanitation and so for their family for that matter the tenants themselves don't see this long term uh, uh, you know uh, this long term benefit because at one point they can move to another you know another uh, plot where they are where there are improved facilities or where they will actually start all over again uh, to advocate for improved facilities okay yeah. thank you um, which uh, brings me to one more question that was asked uh, by Sanjay Gupta, uh, directed to you, Simon. What is the role of policy makers from government if this was private sector driven marketing strategy for sanitation services? Well, um, I'll try to answer the second bit, but I'll start with the first one. Um, in the Kenyan context, policy with regard to sanitation has been a little bit disintegrated. You'd find various acts of parliament resting with the different ministries or, or different departments that are taking. So basically bringing these separate acts of parliament touching on solid waste management, touching on health issues, touching on pollution, you, you, you have to really bring different bodies together. Uh, for us to come up with a concrete concept around, uh, you know, promoting a particular sanitation technology or approach. And, and so their, their role would then be, uh, one, looking back into their pol particular policies and strategies and see if they're in harmony. And uh, I believe uh, uh, what we've learned over time, over the six years, is that most of these sometimes fail to be in harmony. And our role then is to advocate and influence upward to see that the bottlenecks created by a particular act of parliament in a particular ministry is then reviewed. Uh, and I, I, one big output of what we did in AFSAP is the review of the national sanitation, uh, environmental sanitation and hygiene policy by the Ministry of Health that then now brought on board aspects of urban sanitation, aspects of pr transportation that were resting in different ministries, ministries. So this policy then kind of tried to harmonize. They play a critical role. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, if you are going to engage in uh, urban sanitation service delivery as a private sector, there are issues of licensing, 
uh, which had been uh, a, 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 you know a stumbling block because the, the the public sector felt that it's within their domain. Again, the policies did not address this quite well. So there was a whole lot of red tape to, to, to deal with before the private sector would get licensing for this. And um, part of our marketing uh, strategy was to target uh, regulations that are there in terms of uh, licensing the private sector to come on board. And I think uh, in many uh, deliberations that we did to bring them together, private sector did come out strongly that they are interested in engaging in sanitation. So uh, as we were developing the concept, we knew that there is potential to involve the private sector, especially with respect to emptying. That's where they, they had the strong uh, uh, an age. And then there was also the question of uh, the suppliers for materials and the artisans that we train, because the artisans we train are not employed by the utilities. They are not neither are they employed by the trust fund, but they are people who are skilled in masonry and they would want to make a living out of that. And they happen to be locals in the areas we target. So the, the, there was really an open market for the uh, private sector to come in. What we needed to do was to see how can policy support them, strengthen their, uh, you know, their participation in bridging the gap, uh, sanitation improvement gap. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, um, there's a question from Asi Takba. He asked, uh, what should be the right point of uh, beginning when dealing with sanitation marketing? Um, and I'd like to combine that with Tyler's question. As market saturation is becoming a bigger issue in Cambodia, have you begun to experiment more with smart subsidies or subsidized financing options to reach the late adopters at the very base of the pyramid? Both great questions. I mean, I, th I think when we think about the, the right point of beginning when we're thinking about sanitation marketing, we really try to think like a business. So uh, figuring out, you know, what are the market conditions on the ground? Uh, what are the first of all, what are the kind of coverage levels to get to Taylor's question? Um, especially because we work in rural areas, thinking about things like population density, uh, difficulties in transportation. Um, and then figuring out what are the what are the products that are already available and what are people accustomed to buying. So, in the in the case of a place like Ghana where we've just started working, there were really very few products on the market, um, and it was very the, the the supply chain was really uh, fragmented. It was very difficult for people to kind of buy uh, buy everything in one place. So that's one of the big value adds that uh, that IDE and our sanitation marketing model brings to the market is really being able to uh, you know to bring the latrine purchase into one one transaction. So thinking about things like uh, market conditions, existing products, um, existing supply chain, the same kinds of things that a, that a business thinks about. I think uh, the second question, I almost wish I would have planted that question, but I didn't. Um, it's a really great question uh, in Cambodia. We've actually started to do uh, some, some really great work, I think, with, uh, with smart subsidies and financing. Um, we've, we've gotten some initial results from those studies, so we ran a randomized control trial looking at the impact of smart subsidies on the uptake specifically of, uh, of poor households, but also looking at non-poor households. And what we found is that smart subsidies are, are a really great way to increase uptake among poor households um, and to really drive uh, sanitation coverage in poor parts of the country. So. Um, the, the kind of caveat to that is that in Cambodia, there's a, a, a really unique, I don't know if it's unique, but, um, but it's a system where it's very easy to kind of tell who qualifies for uh, a subsidy and who doesn't. Um, so we're, we're able to very easily target where, that, where those subsidy funds go. Um, so I think, the, as I said, the overall kind of takeaway from that is I think there's a lot of promise in smart subsidies. The financing uh, for us is a, is a little bit more difficult. You know, it's been <clears throat> I think it's been difficult finding uh, microfinance institutions and other finance institutions that uh, that kind of understand the, the sanitation market and that are willing to take the risk to dive into that market, even even on a small scale. Um, so, we're, as an organization, we're kind of figuring out what are the what are the trade-offs and what makes it worth it for us to think about um, you know, working with finance institutions or, or potentially thinking about bringing some of those finance 
components in-house. That's, that's something that's a little more in the works. But I think the smart subsidy stuff over the next couple of months, I think we'll put out some, I, th I just think some interesting conversation starters about the potential for, for smart subsidies really to, to drive uptake, especially as Tyler said, as you get to some of those late adopters and, and base of pyramid uh, uh, customers for latrines. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I have one more question that I would like to pose to Simon. Um, how is the cost recovery um, for the treatment plants, and who ultimately pays for the operation and maintenance of the infrastructure? Yeah, the infrastructure of the of the decentralized treatment facility that you were talking about. Um, thank you, Doreen. Um, yeah, remember uh, the treatment plant is fully financed by the Water Services Trust Fund. So, so this through a grant uh, uh, to the water service provider. However, the motive for you know uh, establishing that is looking beyond you know just constructing a facility. We are looking at how do they operate that facility sustainably? How do that facility ensure that there is complete service delivery, sanitation service delivery. And that then brings the question of uh, can, this, uh, uh, can, can this facility run by itself without, you know, involving the households to make payment for, you, you know, for, for the service that they get uh, when their facilities are emptied. So we've looked at, uh, the program has looked at um, <clears throat> the whole uh, uh, financing model across the sanitation value chain and and it, it's not one single option that runs uh, uh, the facility we have given several other options one option is is that um, the utility if the water service provider has an exhaustor because a treatment plant will only work if there is the front end that is the, the, the toilet without a toilet the treatment work serves no purpose. And so one aspect of even the sanitation marketing is approach the households and tell them about telling them about the operations of their facility. That is for their facility to be long term, to last long, to serve them better in a clean environment, they have to do emptying. And there has to be a fee for emptying. This fee either goes to the private exhaustor or the private sanitation team that have been formed through the program, or it goes still to the utility, if the utility has an exhaustor, so that the utility then transports uh, either the private sector or the utility or the sanitation team transport the sludge to the treatment work. Where the utility does that, obviously they will have an operator situated there with uh, whom will be handling the issues of, you know, disposal. And so this is a whole business uh, chain that is built on the water utility. Where we have the private sector, the emptying activities are arrangements that are done privately between the household and the private exhaustor. But the private exhaustor will definitely have to access the treatment facility owned by the water utility. So it means at the entrance to start disposal, the private exhaustor will have to pay a fee to the, uh, to, to, to the water utility or to the operator uh, stationed there by the water utility in order to dispose of the sludge. Now, that's one thing. We have had cases where there is a blend of two. Private exhaustors operate in the same environment as the utility exhaustor operating in that. And so we have split the operation again in the same manner. Uh, another uh, last model is where the utility franchise out the entire treatment plant to a private operator with exhaustors. So the utility will simply be getting some monthly fee or, or uh, generated from you know treatment from the you know, from franchisee who is operating the facility. So those are all models that we've crafted around the concept of emptying um, transportation and the deposition of uh, sludge in the treatment work. Okay, great. Thanks so much.
Um, I think we've really run out of time. Thank you so much to the two presenters, uh, Greg and Simon. Those were very interesting presentations. Just some information to the participants for the questions that have not been answered. Uh, I apologize for that, but we've completely run out of time. Everything will be, all the questions will be uploaded in the discussion forum in the link that I sent to you earlier. And I will ask the, uh, both Simon and Greg to answer them, and then I will alert all of you um, once they've been answered by the two presenters. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Greg again and Simon for a very interesting presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if you still have some questions, you can still write them down in the chat section, and I'll take them into I'll take them together with the other questions that have not been answered. Thank you very much, everyone.